of the Young Men's Ensemble. Today I have two honorable assistants helping me with presenting my research work. The first is... Hi. <laughs> Mr. Lifflin. And the second is... Vivi. So let's all give our assistants a quick round of applause. As I've stated already, my name is William Cheng. Currently the third year in Young Men's Ensemble. I think eighth or ninth year total in LACC. And today I just wanted to share a few facts and stories about the country we are going on tour in and some of the highlights along the tour route. So let's get started. Yes, let's and, go William. Thank you, thank you. In just a few hours, right now to put this into perspective if we were in frankfurt which we currently are germany is not on the map spain is bordered to the north by france and then to the east by germany so if this is bilbao we are approximately here <laughs> in just a few hours i think in one hour we will be boarding our plane to bilbao which will take us to the north central coast of spain that coast is called the Green Coast, and our first stop is Bilbao. For those of you sitting in the front, you may notice that there's several drawn lines here. Just like the US has 50 states, Spain is divided into many more provinces, and the Spanish government groups a few provinces of Spain together into what they call autonomous communities. So I wanted to provide a brief preface on the different autonomous communities we'd be visiting as well as the tour route that we're following. First up is Bilbao. Bilbao is the capital of the Basque Country Autonomous Region and it is the only city in Basque Country in which we are visiting. After our first day in Bilbao, we drive south to the much larger autonomous community of Castile and Leon, which encompasses four of our 10 total stops. Our first stop in Castile and Leon is Burgos. Burgos is one of the largest cities of this region uh, and it's bordered to the north by Basque Country and the region of the Asturias. After Burgos, we drive farther west to another city in Castile and Lyon, which is known as Lyon. So the, uh, the reason why the city is named Lyon is because the region is also named Lyon. From Lyon, we transit to our, our two cities in Mr. Fernando's home region of Galicia. Galicia is in the northwest frontier of Spain, bordered to the south by Portugal and to the west by the Atlantic Ocean. There we will get the chance to explore Santiago de Compostela, which is at the end of one of the most important pilgrimage, uh, pilgrimages in the whole world. And of course, we can't forget about just a mere 30 miles or so south of Santiago de Compostela, that is Mr. Fernando's hometown of Vigo. good three nights in Vigo exploring the hometown of our artistic director where we then where we then start our journey back into the main region of Castile and Lyon. There we visit first Avila in which we get to stay in a 16th century castle hotel. All of you must be very excited for that. Then we are given the chance to explore the surrounding regions, including Salamanca, which is not only an important large city, it's also an educational capital of the world. And I will be explaining that in more detail later. And finally, we cap it off in central Spain with Madrid and the surrounding regions. Let's total this up. We will visit four autonomous communities in Spain with 10 total stops. And with that, I would like to pass it on to some... Uh, 
So first of all, I wanted to uh, let me cover this up very quick. Uh, first of all, I wanted to ask for some volunteers to share what they know about Spanish history, culture, or economics. Any volunteers? Yes. Other volunteers. What do you know about Spanish history, culture, or economics? Yes, Daniel. Oh, I was going to, uh, 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 the Spain were very rich colonizers. Yes. <laughs> that is true. And, uh, yes, you have another Okay, that's fine. So, oh, Ryan. The Spanish sailed many great ships across many seas. Okay. Okay. Power. That's <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Yes, the Inquisition. <laughs> so today I wanted to cover a brief history of Spain. Uh, we'll start from the earliest eras of settlement. Now the area that is now known as Spain was first settled by actually a barbarian group called the Visigoths. Now, this region was then taken over by the mighty Roman Empire. And during this time period, there were actually two main powers of the Mediterranean Sea. Does anyone want to guess what these two main powers are? Maybe someone different. Uh, Whoa! Wait, what did you uh, Rome, Rome, yes, and one more. Carthage. Carthage, very good. Rome and Carthage. And when you put, uh, and as many of you may know, Rome and Carthage do not mix. You put them together, you get the Punic Wars. <laughs> Spain was a frontier of the Punic Wars, and it was the site where the famous Carthaginian general named Hannibal Barca marched his troops northward through France to attack Italy from the Alps in the north. However, this failed, and of course, a few years later, Rome took full control of the Iberian Peninsula. This is especially significant because the Romans gave Spain the, uh, its very first name, the province of Hispania. So that is where Spain gets its name. All good things come to an end, and so do empires. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'll leave it up to all of you to debate whether empires are good, uh, empires are good or not. But after the fall of the Roman Empire, the region fell into chaos. And in year 711, a group of North African Muslims called Umayyad Moors were able to push from their homelands in Morocco and Algeria up into Spain, successfully conquering the whole southern half of it. Now, what happened to the north, you may ask? Well, there were several feuding Christian kingdoms, such as the Kingdom of Leon kingdom of, uh, and the king uh, Kingdom of Castile, which were constantly at odds with each other. It wasn't until 1492, 700 years later, that the Christian kingdoms were finally able to put aside their differences and push the Moors out of Spain, ending Umayyad rule of Spain, and thus thus founding the kingdom and the empire of Spain. But once again, good things always come to an end. And by the end of the 19th century, the Spanish empire, which had once controlled almost half of the world's landmass, had fallen and uh, was on the brink of collapse. Does anyone want to guess what was one of the last straws that caused the collapse of the Spanish Empire? Yes, Annie? Yes. Did they really issues with the economy or something? 
That's a very good point, but I, oh, me too. Uh, the main, the ma the main, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, there, there definitely, most definitely was, and this leads into the main last straw to why the Spanish Empire finally collapsed, and that is because of us, the Americans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the late 19th century, in about 1890, we decided that we would try to give Spanish colonies, such as the Philippines and Cuba, some freedom. So we drove the Spanish out of their colonies, and guess what? We took them for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where was the freedom, you may ask? Not quite there. But in spite of this, lots of the Spanish people were so enraged at the failures of the monarchical government. So a few years later, the people rose up and abolished the monarchy which established a republic in Spain. However, this republic was extremely corrupt with one dictator following the other until a popular military general named Francisco Franco in 1936 rose up against the Republicans, establishing nationalist Spain and instigating the bloody Spanish Civil War, which would pit Spaniards even within the same family against each other. Spain today is very different. Spain in the past may have been authoritarian, it may have been corrupt, but the, in the Spain that we know it today, Spain has a booming economy, it is one of the largest countries by mass, by population and economy in the entire European Union. Spain, for the most part, has shaken off the, uh, the darker part of the influence that came during Francoist Spain, which collapsed in the 70s after the death of Francisco Franco. And it's a major cultural hub in southwestern Europe as well. Spain has a lot of different festivals and national foods, such as the running of the bulls, which if you have not heard of before, is literally where people run with bulls in the street. Then we also have some famous dishes like paella, which is essentially a seafood stew uh, cooked to perfection. Yeah? Well, you can talk about that when we get to Spain. Okay, so Spanish economy is one of the, uh, as I mentioned, one of the stronger economies in Europe. It has a GDP of $1.5 trillion and a GDP per capita of $30,000, according to the World Bank. Now I would like to invite our second uh, uh, presenter assistant <laughs> to come up and take the yeah. Let's give Mr. Lesnar a round of applause. We start our journey in the north of Spain. It's a scenic little city called Bilbao, and it's the capital of the Basque country. Now, you'll notice, hey, look, look at that flag. Why does it have a Union Jack on it? In other words, why does it kind of look like the British flag, but with different colors? Yes? No, no, no. Uh-oh. No, raise his hand. Yes, The British colonized them at one point. Not quite. Actually, <laughs> the, uh, this region is inhabited by the Basque people who speak a different language and have different customs than regular Spaniards. Now, actually, Basque people are more related to the Irish and English Celts than to the Spaniards, which accounts for the um, ethno-linguistic differences between the two groups. So most people in Bilbao will either know how to speak Basque or Spanish or a combination of the two. Bilbao is also very famous for its modern cityscape and one of the uh, adornments of this cityscape is the Guggenheim Museum which we will get to visit. It was designed uh, by architect Frank Gehry and commissioned in 1997. Does anyone know who, uh, what Frank Gehry is famous for. 
Walt Disney. <laughs> if you, uh, if you uh, were guessing firsthand, if you took a look at the structure of the Guggenheim Museum, you'd see that actually the architecture be uh, behind those two buildings is actually quite similar. So that gives you a hint. Our next stop is about a two. Oh, Deb. So I just wanted to point out that the reason our tour t-shirts are this green that Steve Burns is wearing is because he's affiliated with the Basque region, which is where we are Thank you, Deb. Yay! Our next. Our next stop is about a two mile, uh, not two mile, two hour drive south of Bilbao into the region of Castile and Leon. And it is one of the most scenic uh, cities that we will get to visit. And it's called Burgos. Burgos is most famous for its Gothic cathedral, which juts out of the cityscape. It's the tallest building in the city. And uh, it was actually it was it started building in the 1200s and finished in 1567 so that's three centuries of construction work put into that massive gothic cathedral truly a masterpiece of all of uh, the, the spaniards living in the city aside from aside from the huge cathedral burgos is also uh, very famous for its scientific contributions as well as its food so all of you foodies out there just like me you you'll enjoy the food there uh, actually Burgos was named by UNESCO as the capital of gastronomy so that just goes to show how good their food is Next up, we have Lyon, which is about another two-hour drive west of uh, Burgos. And just like, uh, just like Burgos, it has a massive Gothic cathedral. Lyon is an ancient city. It was founded in the first century before Christ as a Roman outpost. Because, as you'll recall, the Romans wanted to protect their claims in the Iberian Peninsula and therefore help their empire strengthen. Now I'd like to ask a quick question. Who here, uh, actually raise your hand, uh, uh, you don't need to shout it out. Uh, who here has heard of parliament? That's crazy. I see most of your hands up, so that's a good thing, right? Uh, who here thinks they know what the birthplace of parliamentary government is? Yes? Okay, but if I didn't show you, what would you do? Uh, well, uh, well, personally, I thought before researching that it was England. Actually, Parliament existed in England only from 1215, but as early as 30 years earlier in the Kingdom of Lyon, the King of the Kingdom of Lyon, King Alfonso IX, instituted a parliamentary government which included three classes of people the nobles the clergy and the commoners this was the very first parliament undoubtedly one of the crown jewels of our tour is santiago de compostela santiago de compostela is to spaniards and christians as mecca is to muslims 400,000 people attempt this pilgrimage every single year, and most of them actually make it. The trail starts in the French Pyrenees Mountains on the border with Spain and extend for 600 miles until converging on Santiago de Compostela. As we will be walking part of the most, uh, well, the most famous part of the Santiago, we will be seeing some of these headstones. Now, what do these headstones mean? There is a yellow scallop painted on a blue background. That is actually the symbol of St. James, who is the patron saint of Spain. Now, St. James is, uh, is told to be the, one of the 12 apostles of Jesus. And after Jesus was crucified and ultimately died, uh, the, uh, actually St. James's body was also moved from the Holy Land over to Galicia in Spain, where it's rumored that his remains are actually preserved underneath the cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. 
the cathedral itself is a massive work of art. It, I believe that it is 97 meters long and 22 meters high. So a massive cathedral uh, and very ornate too. So, so significant that if you haven't already seen uh, on one or two cent euro coins, you might be seeing the engraving of the cathedral here. Of course, that's if you have the, Spano, uh, the Spanish euro coins, not German euro coins. But uh, <laughs> you'll have to go to Spain to take a look at those. We can never forget about this next location, which is Mr. Fernando's hometown of Vigo. If Santiago de Compostela was the religious capital of the Galician region, then Vigo is one of the two capitals, economics and politics, in the Galician region. Along with A Coruña up in the north, the city is the second largest city in terms of population and economics in the region. And it was just like before, uh, other cities that we've already seen built on a Roman fortress overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. Now I'd like to ask you, again, raise your hands if you know. Have you heard of the French Revolution? <laughs> That's crazy. Okay, so would anyone like to answer the question? Hopefully someone different. Who came to power after the French Revolution ended? Uh, so uh, after the after the fires and the uh, murdering all ended. Napoleon Bonaparte. Yes, and Napoleon Bonaparte, as we most of us will know, he was a great military general, expanded the French Empire over the greater half of Europe, if not almost all of Europe, and unfortunately Spain came under uh, the French Napoleonic rule. Now, the Spanish people detested French direct rule, and so much so that in Spain, we often say that Napoleon Bonaparte became Napoleon blown apart. <laughs> his best armies in the Iberian Peninsula, his best armies in the Iberian Peninsula were utterly decimated by Spanish guerrilla forces, and actually Vigo is a center of celebration of freedom from the French rule, because Vigo was actually the first city in continental Western Europe to be freed from Napoleonic rule. From Vigo, we drive around the Portuguese border south to a historical city named Avila. Now Avila, if not uh, one of the most important medieval cities of all time, is the most important uh, medieval uh, city in all of the world. This is because Avila is so well historically preserved. Avila, uh, th this fact is exemplified by the city wall of Avila, which have been standing for centuries, even braving through the onslaught of the Spanish Civil War. Those walls encircle the entire city, so it's a rare sight to see. Most city walls of medieval cities have been torn down or have uh, just collapsed after wear and tear, so it's uh, truly a wonder to be able to see this. Avila itself was built on a very rocky hill, so it's one of the highest cities uh, in Spain by elevation. It's 3,417 feet above sea level. And one thing to note in particular is that although Spain being a, a Catholic nation, of course, it's expected to have a lot of churches and ornate cathedrals. Actually, in Avila, the number of churches per capita is the highest in all of Spain. So expect to be, uh, when you go on your city walk, expect to be seeing a lot of the uh, churches and cathedrals. After Avila, we backtrack a little to uh, nearer to the Portuguese border to a town called Salamanca. Salamanca is one of the most important 
uh, uh, ec uh, not economic, educational capitals of the entire world because it houses one of the oldest universities in the world as well. Actually, the University of Salamanca was founded formally in 1218. That's when it started giving out degrees for studies in theology. Actually, the university was established under Umayyad more rule. So it was a little more inclusive until the Reconquista came and uh, all that was studied from that point on was Catholicism. Um, however, formal teaching in the university started as early as 1113. With that being said, it's the third oldest university in the world. Does anyone want to guess the second uh, and first, the, uh, the second oldest and the oldest universities in the world? There's no penalty for being wrong. Does anyone want to give a try? Yes, Max. Is one of them in India? Not quite. Uh, all in Europe, the three oldest Yes, me, yeah. Uh, not quite. Europe? Oxford. Oxford is the second oldest. Cambridge? Cambridge, not quite. The oldest is the University of Bologna in Italy. So uh, Salamanca, due to its strategic location, it lies on the Tormes River. It actually was the site of multiple battles between the Christians and the Umayyads in uh, the Reconquista. And uh, if on a clear day you visit the old city, you'll see the entire old city being reflected on the, uh, on the surface of the Tormes River. It's truly a very nice sight to see. It's also worth noting that Salamanca was one of the first urban areas to fall under Francisco Franco's rule, because, mainly because the residents supported Francisco Franco. And it became his, his temporary capital until the capture of Madrid. Toledo is within the vicinity of the Madrid area, and it, is, it has always been known as the city of three cultures. For the longest time, it served as the capital of Umayyad Spain before, again, the Reconquista, and was known as the city of three cultures. Which three, you ask? Christians, Jews, and Muslims. So those three, uh, three religious uh, peoples all came to settle the city. In the center of the city, there is a huge fortress. It was built in the third century, and the city, due to its well-fortified location on the banks of the Tagus River, has been used as a fortification against enemies by successfully, uh, successively the Visigoths, the Romans, the Umayyads, and finally the Spaniards. From there, we take another stop at Segovia, which is actually, I believe, to the to the northeast of Madrid, uh, while Toledo is to the northwest of Madrid. Now, Segovia is known for three main landmarks. The first one is the cathedral, but I suppose that all of you have seen enough of cathedrals in my presentation, so I decided to just include the other two. Yes, Adrian? You, you want? I want to guess what that one is. What, what is this one? Aqueduct? Yes, it's an aqueduct. Uh, David, we'll get to you later. So the, so this was this is a long-standing... Uh, actually, I was uh, about to ask this. This is a long-standing legacy of Roman culture. Uh, when the Romans inhabited Segovia, they built this 17-kilometer long uh, aqueduct into the nearby mountains so that water could be easily fed into the wells of the city. And uh, here, here is the Alcazar of Segovia, or the castle of Segovia. Now is the time to ask someone, when you look at this castle, does it remind you of something? Maybe some new faces? Yes, Miss Liu. 
Yes, the Cinderella Castle. Uh, Walt Disney drew inspiration on the uh, well, the Walt Disney Castle to uh, off of the Alcazar of Segovia. So uh, I'm sure your parents will be happy after going to uh, after going to look at this this magnificent Alcazar. Then I don't think you'll ever have to go to you know, Disneyland again. <laughs> And finally, last but definitely not least, we have Madrid, which is the historical capital of Spain. Madrid, in its early years, was actually not supposed to become the capital of Spain. It had always been in Toledo, but the Umayyad settled the location to provide protection for Toledo. So therefore, uh, after uh, Madrid was taken back by the Christians, they named Madrid as the new capital of Spain. The city of Madrid is the second largest in terms of population in all of Europe. It has around 3.3 million inhabitants and the the first largest city, well, actually, does someone want to guess what the first largest city is? Yes, Ian. Berlin. Berlin, with a population of 3.5 million. So quite close, the gap, but still, uh, still a sizable portion. Actually, in Madrid, Madrid is known as a city of firsts. So there's a lot of things to look out for in Madrid. One of the uh, one of the areas to look out for is uh, most uh, well. One of the uh, most important areas to look out for is the famed Prado Museum, which we will be visiting as a tour group. The Prado Museum is the national museum of art in Spain, and it houses one of the largest and finest collections of European art. Other places that you can perhaps go visit are uh, the National Palace of the Royal Family. Yes, the Royal Family was reinstated after the fall of the Francoist regime, and they currently reside in the Royal Palace, which is open to the public. And so are the Royal Gardens. Spain is also known for, uh, not, not uh, Madrid is also known for its famous restaurants, including uh, certain Casa Botin, which has been open since 1725. So that is the oldest restaurant in the world. But I'll leave the rest to you as you explore in Spain. Thank you. <laughs>